All right, welcome everybody. This is a conversation with Greg Lamont, ceramicist, uh, coming to you from two locations. Uh, my name is Terry, and I work at the Octagon Center for the Arts. And I'm the manager of the Octagon Shop, but tonight it's a little it's a little busy downstairs. We have some other stuff going on, and so I decided to come up here into our ceramic studio, which is on the second floor. And we don't have the second floor open just yet, um, but that's you know so which is why I'm not wearing a mask. But we are starting to have classes. The Octagon is located in Ames, Iowa, and we have classes and a gallery, and um, we have a retail shop. And Greg is one of our um, shop artists, and he's going to uh, share with us all kinds of wonderful technical technical information. But also, we'll learn a little bit about how he got started and. Um, so we're very excited, and he's going to start us off with um, just showing us how he pulls a, a, a pot. And you can see this here is one of his famous stomping ground mugs. If you're from Ames, you know this mug, and uh, it's very, very popular. We sell so many of these, and so maybe that'll is that what you're going to pull up, Greg? Yep, we'll ready? Yep, all right. So how do you just get going? See what all right. So all right. I'm going to make a mug uh, here, one of my typical stomping grounds mug. Um, this is about a pound and a quarter of clay. And the first thing I'm going to do is make sure it's stuck well to the wheel head. Then I'm going to add water so that the clay creates this stuff we call slip, which is allow the clay to slip through your hands while you're throwing. Now the first step, got that down, is to center the clay. Oh, so awesome. I'm squeezing the clay, manipulating it between my two hands. Forcing, forcing this clay to the center point of the wheel with both hands until the clay doesn't wobble anymore. This is so cool. Then I'm going to open. One thing I'll say about throwing clay on the potter's wheel, throwing is from a, uh, a uh, Saxon, I believe, Saxon word or to turn so we're not actually like throwing the pots across the room we're turning them on the wheel um, so now i'm doing with the process called opening where i'm using my thumb and my fingers to create the inside of the pot and then i'm going to pull out the floor of the pot and i'm going to compress the floor You make that look so easy. <laughs> this is years of practice. Throwing how pots on the wheel. Are you going to admit to how many years? Oh, goodness. How many years have I been doing this? 40 some odd years, I think. <laughs> and you're only 40. I learned, I, I learned in, uh, uh, in my first college career in 1972 or three. And I've sort of been doing it ever since. So uh, it's been a while. Um, the, the interesting thing about throwing pots on the wheel is that it's by and large a physical skill. Um, learning how to read the surface of the clay and to get your nerves and your muscles to react appropriately. And once you can do that, you can then clay do what you want it to do, bend the clay to your will. Um, as far as the type of work that I do, is largely functional pottery. Uh -huh. you know, uh, that part, the art part of that can be taught um, because there are certain things that work and certain things that don't. And 
other than you know other you know like ceramic sculpture or something like that where you really do need probably more artistic talent than I than I do. But what I did while I was talking was I was pulling up the wall. And I don't know if you could see my fingers, but these fingers are on the inside of the pot. These fingers are on the outside. And because of the floor, the inside fingers are slightly higher than the outside finger. And as I'm lifting up, the clay is snaking through my two sets of fingers. And I'm stretching the clay upward, if that makes sense. And now I'm going to do it again. And each time I do this, the clay gets taller. Until I have my cylinder to the diameter and the height that I want it to be. Then I do the shaping into whatever I'm going to make it into. In this case, a mug. This is a tool that's called a rib or a kidney. And I use that to help me shape the clay with very little friction because the clay is very, very soft right now. And if it sticks, it could just collapse. So I'm using the, uh, the uh, kidney and my fingers to shape the mug into its final form. And then I will do a little bit of trimming. Going to add a little bit more decoration. And there is the body of the mud. Now I'm going to cut it off, but not move it from its little perch that it's on. That's just to pre-cut it so when I cut it off again, it doesn't, I don't cut through the floor accidentally. And that is the finished mug body. That is lovely. Which I will add to the other mug bodies that I threw earlier today. That is really cool. We had a little hiccup. Woo. We had a little hiccup there, so you were flying solo for a little bit. Sue, you oh. did a wonderful job with the camera work. Um, but yeah, no. I have to clean my hands and go get the next piece. Okay. And I'll be right back. Okay. So that was that was the first part of making a mug. The next, right. part, the next part is after the mug has dried a little bit to what we potters call leather hard, uh, I will do a little bit more trimming and then I will add the handle onto the mug. So I'm going to go get the mug that I've been power drying in the other room and uh, I'll be back in two seconds. Okay, wonderful. Can you hear me, Sue? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Oh, okay. Okay. Because Greg was kind of not answering me. So I just wanted to show a little bit of a close-up of this finished mug that you can purchase at the Octagon shop. And you just saw Greg pull the body of the mug, and he's going to show, and that has to dry separate from the handle, and he's going to bring uh, bring in his uh, the mug he, he did earlier. Oh, here he's back. And I'm show done. us how he attaches the handle. All right. I was drying this in the room so the fan would not make too much noise. Okay, so this is now what we call leather hard. While the other mug was all squishy, this one is now stiff enough that I can handle it without damaging the shape. But there's a little trimming that needs to be done on the bottom. So I'm going to do that now. This is a little process I use to center the mugs called tap centering. 
lots of little skills that one has to learn. <laughs> Throw pots on the wall. This is my trimming tool. And I'm just a uh, little up on the bottom. Make sure that's smooth. I will say that um, anybody who's watching live right now can post a question in the uh, uh, comment box and we'll be able to see that. And once I get the little, oops, a little bit of cleanup done, never, oops. <laughs> once I get the little bit of cleanup done, then uh, it is now ready for a handle. And I have a handle handy. So this is a handle that I made earlier. Nice. And I'm going to attach it now. I'm doing what's called scoring. And that's to work a rough surface and I attach it. It will so attach. You're scratching, you're scratching into the clay. Right, and adding a little water to make again some slip or slurry to kind of glue the handle to the pot. Now, I can't tell you how long I tried to put handles on right side up and they kept flopping because of gravity. And then a potter showed me how to do it working with gravity. And that's all the difference in the world. Oh, so you get that nice curve that you like. Right. So I took the mug upside down attached the top of the handle and then I curve the handle around but I don't attach it yet until I get all the uh, the shape that I'm looking for and the right length you can see how working with gravity it kept that nice curve in the handle yeah. And, and now I'm going to uh, attach the bottom. Do that by pinching in with my thumb, pulling to the side, and then popping off the leftover part of the handle into what has been called a fishtail join because it sort of looks like the tail of a goldfish or something oh. like that. It's so a very you simple. Kind of, you kind of cut out a little bit. Repeat how you did that bottom one again. I put the bottom attachment. Okay, I just take my thumb and I press in and pull to the side, press in, pull to the side, and then I pop the remaining tail off. Oh, okay, okay. And that okay. gives a very nice uh, attachment. And very secure. I never <laughs> noticed that. I never <laughs> noticed that about your mugs. Well, that's typically the way I do it. Now, lots um, of different different ways yeah. of attaching handles, but and there's that yeah. part. Then the last thing I do after the handle is dry enough, I make my characteristic little thumb button. Yeah. And thumb I do that. Yeah. Taking my so, a little ball of clay, kind of pinching it into a teardrop shape. Yep. And I would stick that right onto the handle the like that. Somebody that, just said the other day how they love the thumb button. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, lots of folks like the thumb button. It makes a... Uh, but mug, a handmade mug, very comfortable to hold. Yes. So there is there a mug. Is a, there is 
So now you're gonna have to fire that twice. You're gonna have to fire it to biscuit and then fire it to glaze it. Um, All right. So the first it has to dry completely to what we call bone dry, and then it gets fired uh, to about 1850 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or what potters call cone 06 to 04, a little bit hotter yet. And uh, then it gets glazed. And glaze is nothing more than all the materials you need to make a thin layer of colored glass on the outside of your pots. And mm -hmm. uh, the rest of this, we're gonna go into the other studio and we can talk about glazes. Okay. Sounds good? And sounds wonderful. And okay. I'm, I'm gonna take Greg off while they, they go into the other room. So, as I mentioned, Greg's mugs are really super popular. Another thing that has become super popular, and Greg has a lot of these in the shop, is these garlic bowls. And it's just a simple little bowl, and he's made this sharp surface on the bottom, so you can grind, you can mash up garlic. I am not a cook, so I don't really know how to do this. But anyway, um, and you add some olive oil and maybe some other seasonings and you have a really yummy little dip for bread or something else. If I knew if I knew how to cook, I could tell you more. But they're very popular. We have lots of different colors. Greg has been having fun um, experimenting with other colors. Okay, so Greg is back. Oh, them. Okay, we're going to, this is the time to geek out on glazes, right? Right. Okay. So, but first, um, so you've been doing this for, what, 40 years, you said? For, yeah, about 40 years. <laughs> That's awesome. That's fantastic. What was, I just want to ask you, what was your first memory of playing with clay? How old were you? Uh, Oldie, you know, modeling clay, the oil-based modeling clay that kids play with all the time. Maybe they don't anymore, but back in the day, you got a box of clay, and there was a red stick. It looked like sticks of butter. There was a red stick and a blue stick and a green stick and a yellow stick, and you could manipulate this clay, and it would never dry out because it, it had a oil base, a linseed oil base. And that's why I preferred that clay over, say, Play-Doh, because Play-Doh dried out, and then you had to kind of throw it away, you know, whereas, unless you want things, but I never wanted to keep anything. I just like modeling things and making things. But I can't remember when I was doing that. I was quite young um, when I discovered modeling clay. <laughs> Old enough to not eat it. Um, but that and but it was, you, go ahead. Uh, the other thing I did far longer than many kids is play in the sandbox. And I didn't care whether it was mucky or anything. So I didn't, didn't have a, uh, a um, fear of getting dirty and playing in the muck, which is kind of a thing with clay. It's, it's also good to not be concerned about getting dirty or mucky. Yeah, um, yeah. So my uh, first clay experience, I'm sure, was in elementary school where we made the obligatory ashtray because, uh, <laughs> you know, everybody seemed to smoke back then. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, and that was the first time I think I ever had a pot that was fired and glazed and, you know, brought it home to my folks. I'm sure it wasn't beautiful. Um, but it was a permanent object. And uh, uh, in high school, we didn't have wheels, so we could only hand build. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't even recall that we had glazes. I think we just played with clay and it got fired and that was the end of it because I don't remember anything ever being glazed. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was college when I discovered the potter's wheel. And that was it. Uh, 
I fell in love with Potter's Wheel and have been sort of making pottery ever since. That's awesome. Now, that's kind of my story on how I got to play. Um, back in the day, uh, there were no, there were glazes, but the glazes were all for low fire pottery, uh, much of which is not really food safe because it uh, tends to absorb water uh, through uh -huh. the pot in that. Um, and high fired pottery is what we did. We fired in a gas kiln uh, and we fired to what's called stoneware temperatures, very hot, about 2300 degrees. And there were no gl commercial glazes available at that temperature range. Uh, so we had to learn to make our own glazes from raw materials. And uh, so that's where I learned how to use raw materials to make my own glazes, which is something I do to this day. Uh, we here at my studio, Creative Artist Studios of Ames, we br bring in, you know, 50 pound sacks of various materials like silica and uh, whiting and all these chemicals that you use to make a glaze. And we mix gallon buckets worth of our own glazes. The other thing we I learned is that uh, the atmosphere inside a kiln makes a big difference in the appearance of glazes. In a gas kiln, you are uh, burning a fuel. And at a certain point in the firing, you create what's called a reducing atmosphere by slightly starving the fuel for oxygen. And if the flame cannot find enough oxygen in the air coming in around the burner, it will seek out the oxygen that is the colorants in the glaze. All glaze colorants are oxides of metals, iron, chrome, copper, tin, cobalt. Uh, so what you do is you take an oxide which is the colorant, and you reduce it a little bit back closer to the original metal from which it came. Uh, okay, okay. So that's why the mug that I was holding up is called copper red. Right, right. Copper red. I want to show you that. That is the most striking difference. So this is, this is a... Uh, can you see this? This is a there pot that is glazed. This is a pot glazed with copper red glaze, but it was fired in an electric kiln. So it's this beautiful kind of blue. All right. The same okay. glaze. The same glaze fired in a gas kiln turned this beautiful blood red without any changes, just the atmosphere of the kiln. And that's because when it's in the gas kiln, it runs out of oxygen, and so it right. pulls it from the glaze. It pulls it out of the, it's a reaction between copper and a tiny amount of tin to get that, that red color. That's incredible. So, so, I, Fired in the electric kiln, it's blue, kind of blue green. Fired in gas kiln, it's what they call copper red. That's amazing. Same chemistry in the glaze. Glaze. The other thing that happened is uh, the the clay you choose has an effect. Uh, this is a clay called stoneware. The dark brown gray clay. Uh -huh. It's got a lot. Of, it's got a lot of. So uh, when I fire it in stoneware, you get all these little speckles. Can you see those speckles? I think trying to get a little closer. There we go. Perfect. So it's got a lot of speckles. The clay I'm using now is a a white burning clay. 
kind of a gray, very, very light gray. It has very little iron in it. And so the same glaze does not have the speckles in it. More or less the same color, but just not as variegated a surface. And so even if it's fired in either the electric or the gas kiln, it kind of right. has the same effect. Yeah, in the, electric, in the electric kiln, this will be much whiter. It won't have this kind of toasty brown. Oh. Yes. Um, another interesting thing, this is a glaze we call spearmint. This was fired in the electric kiln. Mm -hmm. It's a nice, nice kind of variegated surface on it. This is the same glaze fired much hotter in gas. And they're both yeah. beautiful greens, but one's more of an olive green and the other's more of a minty. Right, right. This glaze, because it was fired so hot, is, is melted to the point that it's all running off the pot, which is why it's kind of dark brown in the bands there, because the glaze has flowed. It's, it's uh, almost, you know, if this glaze was too thick, it would have melted right off the pot. Wow. But it's pretty cool that this place that wasn't designed for that high stoneware temperature can still get there and do interesting things without ruining the pot. Yeah, that's crazy. Here's a mug done in that same, same place. Yeah. This is an interesting glaze. The color this team. Oh, I'm sorry. I was speaking over you. Can you say that again? Okay. This is an interesting glaze. This is a glaze called Woo Blue. It's a rutile blue. Rutile is a naturally occurring form of iron oxide, a tiny bit of iron oxide, and titanium dioxide. Wow. And the interesting thing about this glaze is fired in the gas kiln, it turns this kind of dark mottled blue color. Can you see that? Yeah, a little bit. Hold it more over at the table too. You can get a contrast. There we go. Excellent. It's a very subtle dark blue. Oh yeah, that's great. Yes. That's a very, now that, very popular color here in the octagon shop. Yeah, it is. It's it's what I call a livable blue. <laughs> It's not too not too bright and in your face. Um, the, the interesting thing about this glaze is there's no blue colorant in it at all. It's the way titanium dioxide forms tiny, tiny pools of crystals on the cooling phase of the glaze. When it's going from its molten state to its solid state. Uh, and so what it's doing, it's absorbing all the colors of the light spectrum, but reflecting back your eyes perceive as blue. Wow. So it's, it's kind of a tricky glaze that way, uh, that it's blue with no blue color. In. Wow. And uh, I just want to take you over to our, our glazing area. Okay. And show you uh, one of our boards. Uh oh, we just we just lost Greg. He probably doesn't know that we lost him. So let me text him <laughs> uh, so he can come back in. Uh. <laughs> so that's really cool what Greg was showing us there. Um, uh, let me see, log back in. And his wife, Sue, is a scientist. And, um, but now she's also a very good camera operator with a phone. And I have to tell you that Greg is in his studio at Casa 
in Ames, and CASA stands for Creative Artists Studio of Ames. And they have a shared space, they share a building, and um, in their space, there's, there's a whole lot of potters, um, several of which sell their pottery here at the Octagon. And there's painters, there are multimedia artists, that uh, have books, have studio space at CASA. Um, and uh, there's an acoustic artist, which is like kind of a multimedia with, with painting and wax. And um, it's, that's a really cool medium. And they're located in Ames. And uh, a few times a year, they will have um, some gallery shows and they have, they have their own very nice little gallery and they'll have a spring sale and a fall sale. So you can um, participate in that. Um, and yeah, that's, and then we'll have Greg tell more about the history of CASA. One of the CASA artists is Mary Wisegram. She is a potter. And Mary Wisegram was very instrumental in helping the Octagon with, um, uh, with doing our ceramic um, arts here. Um, back in the day, 1966, the Octagon is called the Octagon because it was actually in an Octagon house just a few blocks away from our present location. And um, that house was not in very good shape, and so they had to move out of it, and they moved into a space on Main Street, and uh, then they also started using this actual building, part of it, not all of it, but part of it, and so during that time, um, one of the kilns was in someone's backyard, and um, uh, they would have to, you know, uh, I think it was a gas kiln for firing was some was in somebody's was in somebody's backyard. So they would have to take the the bisqueware uh, and walk it over to uh, this person's house. And I apologize, I don't have. We have a wonderful book written by Martha Benson, who is one of our founders, um, that tells the story. But so you walk a few blocks um, to take your pottery to go glaze it to fire glaze it. To, to fire the glaze on your pot after, afterwards. But Mary Weisgram, when we bought this building, and this would be sometime in the early 70s. Here we go, Greg's back. Um, can I'm you hear me you, now? I can, we got you back. Um, I was mentioning about how you're at CASA, and one of the CASA artists is Mary Weisgram, and how back in the day, um, when we finally moved into this building, um, Mary, was one of our, she was our, our, our ceramic artist in residence and she actually helped rebuild um, our kilns and stuff and, and got our ceramic program going right here. But, um, but you're over there at CASA. How long has CASA been around, Greg? We're in our 20th year. Oh, wow, that's awesome. And uh, are you one of the original CASA artists? Yeah, yeah. I was the first, uh, actually, the first play person to join Casa. Oh, uh, when the base, the first so at first only a couple of rooms on the third floor of the building were available, and they were all carpeted and stuff. So oh. uh, it wasn't until uh, June of uh, two thousand and one that the uh, basement became available, and uh, potters could yeah. start moving. So. I was one of the original potters, and I think oh. I think your Wi-Fi is not that great in this glaze room. So let's go ahead and have you show us your glazes, and then we should probably go back to your other spots. <laughs> okay. So this is our uh, board for cone six glazes. Uh, that are fired in the electric kiln, designed for firing in the electric kiln. And uh, this board shows what happens when you, since you don't have the ability to use a lack of oxygen to make glazes do interesting things, 
when you have electric fired glazes, you get interesting things by layering the glazes. So this board shows what happens when you layer one glaze over another glaze uh, in both directions. And uh, I think you have the same thing at the octagon for the arts. Yeah. Uh, same board. So this is what a lot of our members do rather than fire the gas kiln is they use the electric kilns, which are much easier to fire, and they rely on the different colors of glaze layering to get them what they're looking for. The advantage of electric firing is that your colors can be much brighter and more colorful. Uh, the hotter you go, and with the reduction atmosphere of the gas kiln, the colors become more muted, and you're sort of basically left with earth tones. Um, whereas with the electric kilns, you can get uh, brighter colors and a wider variety of color. And that's all and I had to say. About. Okay, so the electric kiln, you get brighter colors because it doesn't have a reduction? Yeah, it's always got plenty of oxygen available. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And it's not fired quite as hot as the uh, gas kiln is fired. Okay. Very cool. You guys have lots of glazes. And then you make your own glazes. Are those, is what you're showing, is that all that's available? Or do some of you have your own secret recipes that you like keep in your space? Oh, de yeah, definitely. Some of us have our own secret recipes um, that only we have unless we want to share them with other people. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm going to give you a brief, let's walk down and hopefully we won't lose the, you. And okay. we're going to walk to the kiln. All right. But I'll walk home. Yes. And now you're getting a peek of the, of the whole Casa studio. You can see how roomy it is over there. This, this, is this is what we call shared clay, which is where most of our members work. Uh, the wheels are, and all the equipment in this room is shared amongst the members in shared clay. And what they get is a section of steel shelving for their um, storage. And then at the end of the, this room, we have two studios that are what we call semi-private studios similar to what I have. And those are larger and, and printed on the square foot. <laughs> so now we're going down to the kiln room. <laughs> There's a cabinet full of people's work. Very cool. I see a teapot I recognize. <laughs> Now down, uh, we're coming down at the end of the hall here, past these double doors, is where clay stops and non-clay starts. So the folks that are down at this south end of the building are drawing, painting, those types of things. Yeah, and hopefully your clay dust doesn't go past those doors. And this is our kill. This is. This is awesome, this room. We have uh, five electric kilns and two big gas-fired kilns in this room. And uh, someday, we hope to fill this empty space with yet another kiln. With another what? So one, three, four, five electric kilns and the video stop. This is a big This is where all the magic is. There we go. We kind of lost you a little bit, Greg. So <laughs> The kiln room is kind of far from a uh, but we're we're moving back out. Yeah, we 
We didn't get to see the. Uh, we didn't get to see the the gas kilns. The the video froze on us back oh. there in the, in the bowels of the uh, the studio. So um, let's uh, see if you can stand out here and just. Yeah. So we saw the electric kilns, but the gas kilns are those two. I see one framed in blue and the other to the right of that. You can almost yeah, walk. Both, they're both gas kilns. They're not uh -huh. quite walking, but they hold lots and lots of pots. Wonderful. That's so cool. It's, it's kind of hard to see, but it's really it's really nice of you to show us. So the one is closed up. Is that one cooling? Uh, no, it's just closed up. So the, the, on the, the first one, the all brick one, that door has to be bricked and unbricked, brick by brick. <laughs> um, the, uh, the other kiln, the door swings open. Okay. And just we just keep it closed so that the door isn't in people's way. Other than that, it's very similar on the inside. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. We didn't lose you that time. At least I didn't. So I can see all that. All right. So. All right. <laughs> Sue, thank you for your wonderful camera work. Quite the talented spouse you have there, Greg. That's pretty much all I have, unless you have more questions for me. <laughs> well, um, yeah. The, have you ever had a real job? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I've okay. had a real job. I worked uh we'll find out what he worked at in just a moment once once uh he comes I back. Worked. Oh here he is. He's back. He's back. Okay. When okay. uh yeah. I grew up I grew up in Chicago and when uh, we lived there I uh, worked for my dad and his company through through school and then summers and things like that. And then uh, I ended up working in retail in the art materials business. Really? Uh, back, back before computers took a lot of that away. Uh, back in the day, all the uh, illustration and, uh, you know, advertising and all of that was all done by hand. It was, uh -huh. you know, illustration board and paints and, markers and paper and all of that and uh, then about 1979 1980 uh, all of a sudden the computer started to take over all of that so you had Corel draw uh, one of the early um, computer graphics programs and you had computer aided design on for draft for uh, architecture for drafting uh -huh. and within about three years all of the graphic arts pretty much migrated from paper to computer and many of the big art supply stores in the large cities chicago new york they all went out of business because the majority of what they sold was not to hobby painters and you know, fine arts folks. It was sold, stuff sold to the graphic arts business. And uh, so just about the time we got names in 1983, uh, I got a job working for the bookstore, the university bookstore. In their, art, in their art supply section. Because in school, they still taught you how to do it by the old-fashioned way. You know, yeah. paper, markers, paper, board, that type of thing. So uh, I did that. I worked there until um, I started doing clay full-time. 
That's cool. I didn't know that. Um, I, as an ISC student, I enjoyed um, buying art supplies at the bookstore, even though I was not an art student. So where did you go to college at? Uh, originally, I went to college in Columbia, Missouri uh -huh. at, a, at a school called Columbia College in Columbia, Missouri. Okay. That makes sense. So what, um, is there an artist that inspires you or was there a, a teacher or a professor that, that really helped you along or in some way made you think, yeah, I can do this? Uh, well, Ed Collings, who was my first pottery teacher, was probably the most influential in sort of making you stick with it until you got it. Um, because being such a physical skill, um, you, you're not going to make pots immediately. You uh, uh, are going to struggle just to center the clay. And then yeah. you're going to struggle to make a wall. And then you're going to struggle. It's just a series of struggles and struggles and struggles until you train your nerves and your muscles to, you know, react appropriately to the material and to get it to bend to your will. And uh, two teachers, Ed Collings and uh, Bruce Cash in Chicago at Lil, Lil Street Studios in Chicago. He was another one that just made you keep at it and keep at it and keep at it until you got it kind of didn't let you quit. <laughs> oh, Which, uh, that's nice. And Which was nice. Most of our pottery, especially folks that did it back in the 60s and the 70s, were very influenced by British pottery, uh, particularly the pots um, by Bernard Leach and his family. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, sort of the, the, it's called A Potter's Book by Bernard Leach. And it sort of became, it sort of became the Bible for all kind of functional handmade pottery. Um, he had learned the techniques of Japanese and Korean folk pottery from Soji Hamada, who was a Japanese, very famous Japanese potter prior to World War II. So this was in the 19 teens and early 1920s. And uh, he went over and studied with Soji Hamada in Japan. And then after World War II, Soji Hamada came to England and worked with Bernard Leach in England. And Bernard Leach had many apprentices come from the United States to England to work with him. Uh, Warren McKenzie up in, uh, the late Warren McKenzie up in Minnesota, uh, uh -huh. Clary, Illy, Clary Illion here in Iowa, they were both apprentices with Bernard Leach. Oh, wow. In England, and, and uh, Warren McKenzie taught at the University of Minnesota for his career and trained many, many, many potters in the upper Midwest and uh, was a huge influence in kind of what was taught pottery in the Midwest. Uh, That's really then, cool. Um, you teach. So at Iowa State University, there's the workspace in the basement of the Memorial Union. And yes. you teach pottery at least once every semester when there's not a pandemic going on. Right, right. <laughs> I usually teach uh, a, be a beginning wheel throwing class uh, every semester and in the summer. And my assumption when we take that class is that you've never touched clay before. And so we start with the very basics of, of you know, centering and opening the clay, making a cylinder, turning that cylinder into a mug. And as your skills increase, and um, 
able to do more complex forms, you can make things like uh, casseroles, which is a combination of a cylinder, a wide, short cylinder uh -huh. with a lip onto which you put a small bowl upside down, which is the lid. This handle was formed separately after the lid was dry enough to take some pressure. The lid was, the handle was thrown separately. The handles were added separately. There's that fishtail join. There's your fishtail, yeah. Yep. How, do you, how do you make the lid so it fits though? Measuring. Uh, I'll be right back. I wanna grab a tool. Okay. Look at all that yummy stuff. Oh, see, now you, got, you got good lighting on those pieces there, Sue. That's fabulous. How come he hasn't taken that picture to sell in the store? <laughs> it's on the top shelf. Like what, that. What? I, was, I was eyeballing the picture on the top shelf. Oh. You have casseroles, those little casseroles, but on your top shelf you had what looked like a nice picture. Yeah, Did it's a nice picture. It's a nice picture. It's a little on the heavy side. So oh, I haven't brought okay. it up. So these, All right. are, these are how we make sure lids fit. These are called calipers. Just two pieces of curved metal that are hinged at one end. And what you do is first you would throw the base. Right. And you would make your little seat for the lid and then you would measure using the calipers in this direction okay you would measure that diameter and are there are there lines on the calipers no no nope you just take that that measurement and then you transfer that to a caliper that is positioned like that. Oh. And you get it. Uh, and measure it that way. So do they. Uh, and you throw the lid. Yeah. And they're able to hold. They don't like. I'd be worried I would take that and I would move it. And then I'd have to remeasure again or something, but they say well, well, usually it keeps its measurement pretty well. Good. And of course, throwing this lid upside down like a small bowl. So you do that, and then uh, when you're done with maybe just a little bit of trimming, the lid will fit. Fabulous. You make it sound so easy. <laughs> Uh, well, the, most complicated, <laughs> the most complicated form that potters do is probably the teapot. Yeah. Um, it's got so many parts that have to all, you know, be in proportion with each other. So you've got the body of the teapot, which is your cylinder. Uh -huh. You've got the lid, which is made as a separate piece, again, like a tiny little bowl with a knob, measured with calipers so that it fits. And then you have a spout, which is thrown again as a very slender, tiny cylinder. Uh -huh. And it, that, that is attached to the, to the body of the pot. And then you can either put on a clay handle or a bamboo handle. Uh, lots of different kinds of materials and ways to make handles for teapots. But uh, generally, if you look at any like th book on throwing pottery, you know, they'll start off simply with the cylinder and they'll end up with the teapot. That's awesome. It's amazing. And then, but you have to get the, the, the spout right too and everything. I mean, there's a whole science to that and yeah oh, I think Greg froze up again are you there Greg yeah I think we're just we just have a great shot of Greg there 
<laughs> only, only the teapot. Um, we are getting close to the end of our time. Uh, we could talk all night long, and I could, I don't know about you, but I could watch ceramics, uh, pull pots all night. Um, and you can tell that Greg is incredibly knowledgeable, and um, but he's, he's just been doing it for years and years. Uh, I want to remind people that um, that this is the octagon, and I'm up here in our ceramic studio on the second floor, and we were able to move our studio out from the basement, um, and uh, uh, just before the pandemic started, so. Uh, we had one class in January of 2020, and so there's only been one class in here. But you can see we have we have two, four, six. We have eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electric wheels, and um, we have all the power, and we have the sink, and and everything. So we're ready to go. So. Um, Keep close tabs on us and let us know. We have, or, or we'll let you know when we're ready to have uh, ceramic classes. We don't have any scheduled yet, but we we will. As long as people keep wearing their masks and getting vaccinated, um, you know, just stay safe and let's get through this. We do have some children's classes uh, that are ready to go, and people can sign up for those. And you can find those links on our websites. And um, after this video loads, I will I'll, I'll put the links down below, so they should be there. And we'll let you know. Um, and Greg, I don't know if you can hear me. I can still see you. <laughs> so your your phone is there, but I can't hear you. So if you're talking, I can't hear you. But we'll look at your pretty teapot um, as we say goodnight. So we are, again, the Octagon Center for the Arts, located in Ames. Our website is octagonarts.org. And um, thank you for checking out our YouTube channel. Check out our Instagram and Facebook. Um, the Octagon Gallery Shop does have its own separate uh, Instagram and Facebook. Um, we have a Twitter account, too, but I don't seem to... To be able to find the time to, to post on Twitter much, but um, so that's and we have a, a newsletter that you can sign up for that comes out electronically once a week, and that is probably one of the best ways to keep up to date on our classes and our events, gallery exhibits that are upcoming, um, all of that information uh, that you can that you can do. So Greg's work is. 15% uh, off through the month of May and June because of COVID I extend um, people's work uh, every month we have a new featured artist but because of COVID the 15% off goes through both months and so for instance last month was April so the April featured artist was Lena Bentley she's a fiber artist her work is still 15% off Greg's pottery will be 15% off through the month of June. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Greg. And thank you to Greg's scientist wife, Sue. Um, she's uh, a very well-respected respected, uh, scientist. I apologize, Sue. I Yeah, I won't even say, because I'll get it wrong of what exactly that you do. And um, I would really appreciate um, you helping us out this evening um, and you know uh, technology is great but sometimes the internet just isn't strong enough to, to carry us through but I'll quit yakking now and again thanks everybody and thank you to Greg and Sue and thank you to CASA um, I will also link down uh, to CASA's website so you can learn more about the creative artist studios of Ames good night everybody